Um, where genetic engineering comes in is it takes us to the next level as far as if there's a trait that needs to be changed or um, amended or uh, brought into the population. It, it's a tool that allows us to address some of those issues. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me on this week's episode is Dr. Evan Grusenmeyer. Uh, Evan is a senior research uh, analyst, if I get that correct, uh, at the University of Missouri. Evan, thanks so much for coming on the show. And if you would, please start with a little introduction for the audience. Absolutely. Uh, thank you again for, for having me on this. It's, it's always fun to talk about something that you're passionate about. Um, like I said, my name is Evan Grusenmeyer. I'm, uh, for all intents and purposes, I'm, I'm a genetic engineer um, and I work primarily with pigs at the University of Missouri, although I, I dabble across uh, production agriculture in general. Uh, and so we really think about genetic engineering as, as a tool in the toolbox of, of, of agriculturalists moving forward. I don't want to take anything away from uh, any sort of selection pressure or selection breeding program. There's there's incredible merit. I mean, if you look at the pig, you look at the chicken, you look at the dairy cow, they're incredibly different than what they were even 50 or 100 years ago. We it's it's amazing where we've gotten to. Uh, where genetic engineering comes in is it takes us to the next level as far as if there's a trait that needs to be changed or um, amended or uh, brought into the population, it, it's a tool that allows us to address some of those issues. And we look at the, you know, the exploding global population, uh, disease outbreaks, uh, push for increased animal and human welfare. Uh, we also need to be good stewards of, of our resources. And I think genetic engineering needs to be a tool in the toolbox of, of production agriculture to allow us to, to nimbly respond to some of those uh, novel issues that arise. Yep. It can uh, help us innovate faster. Um, that's for sure. Evan, it's a new tool in our toolbox, and I think it'd be good for our audience to maybe go through some basic definitions on genetic engineering. Um, uh, obviously, been a lot of discussion on gene editing and kind of the differences between gene editing and genetically modified organisms. But take us through some basic definitions in the world of genetic engineering so we kind of go into this discussion with a similar level of knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do want to, to take a step back and, and say that this actually isn't that new of a technology. The, the first um, genetically engineered or transgenic animals were, were created in the 80s. Um, and the only difference between then and now is our ability to do that has, has increased. The, the level of expertise has really dropped. And so the, the barrier to entry is much lower. So you have more bright minds actually working in this field. Uh, but as far as some of the, the commonly... Um, use terms. So we have transgenic um, it, and we, we use these terms and, and they sound complex or scary, but in reality, when you break them down, they're very simple actions and they're all are related or can be related to uh, simple like text editing terms. So if you look at transgenic, it, it simply means a transfer of a gene from a different species to your species. So there's no, there's no way to get a gene from a, a cow to a pig. But we can take and we can read that cow gene and we can copy it. We can write it in the pig version and then we can introduce it to the pig. And so there's no, no crossing between pig and cow, but we can get that genetic merit from that gene from the cow directly into the pig. And so the editing term there would be a copy and paste. So we copy it from the, the cow, we write it in the pig version and we paste it into the pig genome. Um, and then, so another one that we commonly talk about is knockout. It, it simply means to, to remove the gene function. So effectively, you're going to delete that gene from the, the genome or delete its function. And then, the, you know, the scary one is mutate, where you know, there's, there's so much stigma around that. In reality, it just means a change. And that can be a small change or a really large change. Uh, but you can think about that as, as a difference in spelling or punctuation um, of that thing. And so, um, it's, it's very simple in some cases and very, very complex in others. Um, another really important one recently is introgression. 
And that's effectively taking a gene that's present in the population, but not present in your individual and moving it within species from the, that one individual to the individual that you really care about. So in, in the pig world or in the dairy world, you have these nucleus herds where all of the genetic merit is there. But if you found something really, really interesting at the very bottom of that pyramid scheme, it's very difficult and you lose a lot of genetic merit trying to bring that pig up to the top and breed that gene back in and trying to segregate all of the stuff that you want to get rid of and keep the good stuff. Whereas introgression allows you to take that gene, separate it from the rest of the, the alleles there, the rest of that genomic com component and put it back in the one that you really care about to get the better version of that. So that really is just a change in version or a, uh, Another way to put that in the text editor form would be a thesaurus. It's, it's a, the same word, just a different or a, a different word for, for the same meaning. I would presume, Evan, that there is um, some kind of rules of thumb in terms of the ease uh, or feasibility of doing that. And I would think like transgenic, where you're taking genomic information from one species and entering it into an entirely different species would be much, le much, much more difficult than, say, introgression, where you're working within one species group. Is that a fair assumption or no, I've oversimplified it? Yes, it is a slight oversimplification. But... When you look at most of genetics in, in the mammals, it, we'll limit this to mammals, it's fairly similar. So the DNA that the, is used is very similar. The, the bias towards codons is very similar across all of mammals. And so it's often not as difficult as you would think to take a gene and put it in the pig version. So the, the cattle version is going to be very similar to the pig. There's going to be differences there, but they're not drastic, uh, huge structural differences. They tend to be fairly minor and they tend to be within type. So something that's very similar. So amino acid that's uh, very similar to a different amino acid, they can be interchangeable often. And that's often what we see with, with uh, closely related species or at least mammals. As you get further and further away, they're become more constrained. So if you look at the, the pig genome compared to the chicken genome, the chicken genome is very compressed. There's very little intergenic space. Everything is just squished in there. Um, so that is a difference in reality that the, the genomic comp component or taking those genes out and putting them in a different species is not that difficult. And there's a lot of really good tools that, that allow people like me um, to optimize these genes so that we have the best chance of them functioning appropriately in that, that new organism. How do you prioritize what genes to go chase, Evan? Um, you know, assuming that you've got all those tools in your toolbox, how do you, how do you and the folks at the university decide, all right, this species, this gene, this phenotype is our end goal? So th that's a very good question. And I think that there's multiple different answers. I think currently the, the major push is for disease resistance. I think that's kind of the sexy approach that, you know, this is a, a thing that we can market as very good for everyone throughout the whole chain. Uh, and I think that there's a, a lot of merit there. I think when you look long term, I think the shift for genetic engineering may shift more towards uh, nutrition. And, and so if we look at the, the costs of raising a pig, the vast majority of that money is going to feed. And so if we can be more efficient with that feed, um, we can be more efficient as as producers. But I, I think that at the moment, in, in my interest, uh, allow me to kind of chase that. I, I like going after those diseases and trying to figure out uh, novel solutions for those. And I think that there's, there's a lot of potential there. We clearly keep running into uh, new diseases that are coming up, you know, ASF, PED, PERS. These weren't diseases that we really had to deal with to a large extent several years ago. And, and so that's, that's, that's exciting for me. Um, it's an interesting time to be working in the pig industry. It, it's challenging, but I think that there's a lot of potential there. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more.
Well, tons of potential, um, but always two sides of the coin. So, Evan, talk to us a little bit, if you would, about limitations with the technology um, and or just things you may want, you know, a practicing veterinarian like myself to be aware of the, the, the watch outs, if you will. So currently, there are no technical limitations to what we can do within, in, with genetic engineering. Anything that can be imagined with a genetic component, uh, which turns out to be almost everything, we can change. And so we now have the technology with CRISPR and other technologies to target anywhere in the genome and, and make any edit. Uh, the only limitations are, are time, money, politics. Uh, and so the currently the, the regulatory environment is the, is the major limiting factor to uh, wide scale application of genetic engineering and production agriculture. And so this is my my one plug that uh, Congress holds the determination for the fate of these technologies and congressmen and women respond to their constituency, or at least they ought to. So if you feel really strongly one way or the other about genetic engineering, if you think this is a great tool and we should be implementing this, if you feel this is really not a great tool and we shouldn't be implementing this, either way, I, I suggest that you contact your congressperson, tell them how you feel about it, and, and ask them what their feelings or what their thoughts are as far as regulation or changes in regulation moving forward. But as far as what I would recommend to a practicing vet, caveat, I'm not a vet. Um, so take everything with a grain of salt. But I think that understanding the genetic background of an individual can really inform a vet's decision. And so if you think about some of the, the potentials here, so with the PERS knockout pig or the PERS receptor knockout pig, the PERS, PERS resistant pig rather, it is a, a change in a bacterial receptor that is also the receptor for entry for PERS. And so what they did was they removed a portion of that gene, knocking out the ability of PERS to infect that cell, making a resistant animal. There was the potential there that there would be a change in bacterial susceptibility. Turns out that's not, to, not the case. But if it were to be the case and you knew that your pigs or your herd had this genetic background, they were resistant to PERS, you may be more prone to look for some of these bacterial infections because of that. And a, a, another example would be um, Seneca Valley. So if, if we had a pig that was resistant to, to Seneca virus and you went into your barn and you started seeing blisters, you may change how you act. You may act very quickly because this could be an FAD and you're going to want to move very, very quickly. So it may change the, the intensity of your action. Uh, and then understanding the difference between resistance and resiliency. So resistance is that animal cannot get infected. They are resistant to infection. Whereas resiliency is they can be infected, but they just don't show the signs. And they may be shedding virus uh, like gangbusters, but they may not look sick. So uh, that's kind of the, the approach of the wart hog with African swine fever. So African swine fever will infect a wart hog. They don't really show much of the clinical signs. They look just fine, but they are shedding immense amounts of virus. And so if we were <clears throat> to use that same strategy in the pig, we may go into a barn and say, hey, these pigs look perfectly healthy. And if you're not careful and you're not observing those biosecurity practices, you may go to another farm and inadvertently bring ASF to a, a, a naive herd. And that would be really, really bad. So understanding uh, biosecurity is really, really important. And I know vets are aware of that, but continuing to, to make that the key and being aware of the potentials of kind of these peripheral issues that may crop up around genetically engineering in these production animals. Not that anything, the genetic engineering is bad, but they, they may bring other issues or change how you address uh, clinical signs or how fast you act to those, those things that you see. Yeah. If you change the phenotype, it's certainly something that's got to be taken into consideration because that's ultimately what we're trying to manage is the phenotypic results. Absolutely. Tremendous information, Evan. I really appreciate you coming on. Timely, well communicated, very good contributions to the podcast. And uh, from, from our audience, I say thank you very much for coming on this week and educating us on the world of genetic engineering. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me. Well, we can only do this, Evan, because of the audience. So to the audience, thank you for being a part of this. Um, for Dr. Evan Grusenmeyer, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. Thanks for joining us and please have a great rest of your week.